order. Before we begin, can I remind members that they are expected to wear face coverings when they are not speaking in the debate? This is in line with the current government guidance and that of the House of Commons Commission. I remind members that they are asked by the House to have a COVID lateral flow test twice a week if coming on to the parliamentary estate. This can be done either at the testing centre in the House or at home. Please also give each other and members of staff space when seated and when entering and leaving the room. Order, order. Nick Fletcher to move the motion. Thank you, Chair, and it's a pleasure to serve uh, under you today. Uh, I have been asked uh, before I start to send apologies from the Honourable Member of Shipley. He did want to be here, but with the date change, uh, he was unable to make it. So I just want to pass that on. I shall begin. International Men's Day. I'm not really a fan of these days. We seem to have a day for everything at present. Yet, as someone who cares deeply about preventing young boys and men from being left behind, it is fitting that I lead this debate today for International Men's Day. In recent years, there's been a creeping narrative that males have it easy, that life is a breeze and there is nothing to complain about. Me standing here may in fact be used as evidence of this. Yet it is clear that life is tough for many men and young boys, and many of our boys in schools are far from privileged. I, myself, certainly wasn't. In fact, I came from what I would consider a pretty standard working-class background. I do not begrudge that fact at all. Why? Because becoming from such a background gave me the attitude that if you don't do something yourself, no one else will. That attitude is what put me here. Yet it is clear that many young men and boys are struggling, and for whatever reason are lacking a can-do attitude that will enable them to get on with life. The statistics speak for themselves. As a whole, men and boys are disproportionately doing poorly in education and health settings. Just let me read you a few statistics out. Boys are lagging behind at school, especially in maths and English. 13.2% of men are not in employment or education. This is 10% for women. Suicide rates are three times higher than they are for women. Life expectancy for a man today is four years lower than it is for a woman. 83% of rough sleepers are men. And the staggering, yes, a staggering, 96% of the prison population are male. While I do not believe that men are wholly victimised, it is clear if, that if we witness such disparities between other groups, there would quite rightly be an uproar. Yet for me, such statistics do not generate the headlines they should, because issues that affect men do not seem urgent enough to talk about. Why is this the case? Personally, I believe this place operates like a pendulum swinging from left to right and continually, continually struggling to correct wrongs and injustices. It's a very noble endeavour that has been pursued in this great institution for many centuries. However, I am afraid the pendulum often swings so far that reaching an equilibrium is no longer the objective. And so, over the decades, where this place has rightly corrected society's injustices, empowering females, protecting sexual and ethnic minorities from discrimination, we have unfortunately left the struggles of many males out of the discussion. Some may say that men have had their turn, and it's a woman's turn now. However, that's a poor argument, and one that I find rather infantile. Yet it is something that I have heard within the walls of these premises during private discussions, and it's a narrative that I feel that has penetrated popular discourse. Yet um, I am in no way denying that men have had many opportunities that women haven't. And in too many instances, this remains the case. This, in my view, is wrong, and we, it should be continually challenged and put right. However, such a wrong should not be corrected by simply ignoring the issues that many men and boys face. As the saying goes, two wrongs don't make a right. So what can we do? And why did coming from such a working class background not stop me from being in the position I am now? 
Firstly, I believe we must look to the needs for boys to have male role models, just as they need female ones. The need for such male role models is highlighted by groups such as the fantastic charity Lads Need Dads, who have done some excellent work in encouraging boys to pursue their passions and learn skills from male volunteers. The results really speak for themselves, and I would urge all members in this debate to today to look into the organisation's work and promote the group in their own constituencies. And so, it is time we recognise the need for positive male role models for our boys. Failure to do this, after all, will only mean that boys will continue to be let down. Secondly, from this point, it is clear that we also need more male teachers in our schools if we address some of the educational disparities that I touched on earlier. From speaking to teachers in Don Valley, an issue that has been touched upon is that the poor behaviour of young boys with no positive male role models at home is often exacerbated by the lack of male role models at school. Consequently, I say to the Minister <coughs> that, that an active campaign to encourage men to be teachers ought to be a fundamental part of the teacher recruitment and retention policy. Thirdly, it is clear that boys need to have their own clubs, just as girls need their own. Indeed, is it a wonderful thing that girls' football is on TV? It's terrific that female tennis stars are finally starting to be paid as much as their, fail, female, as their male counterparts. And as the father of a daughter myself, I wish to applaud all who have corrected this wrong and the hundreds of other injustices. Yet I would also like to reiterate something that seems to be very topical at the moment, although much more for women than men. And that is the need for men to have their own identity and for masculinity to be something that can be celebrated at times rather than continually vilified. Everywhere, not at least within the cultural sphere, there seems to be a call from a tiny yet very vocal minority that every male character or good role model must have a female replacement. One only needs to look at the discussions surrounding who will play the next James Bond. And it's not just James Bond. In recent years, we have seen Doctor Who, Ghostbusters, Luke Skywalker, The Equaliser, all replaced by women. And men are left with the craze and Tommy Shelby. Is there any wonder we are seeing so many young men committing crime? These programmes make crime look cool. Trust me, a lifetime in prison is not cool, and neither is living with the memory of a stabbed son or daughter. There is no doubt that we have witnessed awful events occur over the past year in which the weak victims have been women. As mentioned as the father of the daughter, my heart goes out to the victims of such crimes and their families. Yet the awful events which have taken place in many ways led to the word masculinity being followed by toxic, more and more frequently in our public discourse. Yet again, we have to ask ourselves, who does this help? I have an answer, that is no one. And how will this, boys, how will this make boys and young men see each other and themselves? Poorly, that is how. Because if we are to strive to be safe and inclusive society, we should not vilify 50% of the population, and neither should we immediately vilify the term masculinity. Because as I hope all women love being women, I love being a man. Most of my friends are men. Indeed, from being an electrical engineering background, most of my former colleagues are men. My understanding of the world and its experience has largely been shaped by the fact that I am a man. I don't think being a man makes me superior in any way. Yet being male is an essential part of my identity. And just as with any other identities, whether they be religious or ethnic, I believe that they are something that should be celebrated, not vilified. Some may argue that I didn't choose to be born male, and so it's ridiculous for the male identity to be celebrated. Yet this is not something I would expect, I would suspect anyone would say about any other identity. And so in short, I believe we should encourage boys and young men to be proud of being men too because it's important for boys to know that as males, they can make a positive difference to society. Leading on from this, I just want to go back to how I end up here. First and foremost, I came from what I believe was a very good home. I was lucky to have good parents, two wonderful brothers. Overall, I was surrounded by excellent role models who often told me, don't say you can't, say I can and I will. And I did, and look where it got me. I also went to a great school with the best head teacher, Mr. Stevenson. He knew what it was to be a great role model, and I thank him for the time he spent with me. 
I went to scouts, I practiced taekwondo, and then at 16 I became an apprentice. During all this time, I was surrounded by male role models, many of which were very good male role models, speaking positively about each other and where they lived. If more of our boys and young men had that experience, we could make enormous strides for the most disadvantaged of boys. So going back to the earlier mentioned statistics on education, some excellent research contained in the APPG for Men and Boys report, A Boy Today, highlights some of the reasons why this may be the case. One such reason is that it is highlighted that boys are more likely to be taught in a vocational setting rather than in a classroom. The government must take this seriously and tackle the fact that boys generally do much worse in a classroom setting. And speaking from a personal perspective, I can see why this may be relevant to many boys in education. I can completely relate. I am an action person. I prefer to learn something on the job and for a reason after which I like to put it in practice. Basically, I just like getting on with it. And I can imagine many boys and young men in education feel the same. So we need to find out what boys are good at. And what they are doing well in, in traditional educational settings, have the resources to support them. If it's something out of school, it should be where possible brought into school, even if it's just an assembly piece. While we should encourage and champion all children, research suggests boys are much less likely to push themselves forward. So this needs to be addressed at every opportunity. Within school, the workplace and home, we should also begin to recognise that language is most important. Negativity is never the right approach. And one of the greatest lessons I learned as a parent and an employer of many young male apprentices over the years is that we must speak positively in front of young people. If there are concerns, these should be addressed privately with other adults who are responsible for the child's development or young person's progression. Telling a young person they are useless or that they will never achieve is catastrophic and this kind of language is too often direct, directed at boys I have been witness to it myself for when a young boy hears this and continually hears masculinity being linked with toxicity in societal discourse then it is no wonder that many suffer from feelings of worthlessness and isolation and that is why I never felt left behind never felt disadvantaged because no one told me I was Instead, I had positive role models who took the time to teach me what an upstanding man should be. And that's what we need more of these days in youth clubs, schools and homes. So I say to the House and the Minister, let's provide families up and down this country with the help and support they need. But let some of that help be directed to our boys and young men. Let's do all we can to introduce policies that help build strong families. Let us help our communities organise themselves around assisting young boys to turn into great men. Great men that can look after themselves, lead and be role models for the next generation. Yet in this quest to uplift young men and boys, let it not be at the expense of the progress women are making in all walks of society. This is especially true after this year's events, which have shone a light on how many, how many women feel vulnerable in many situations. And that is clearly not right. As has pointed out, men have a role to play in solving the societal issue, yet this cannot be done by vilifying men. Instead, it can only be achieved if we encourage young men and boys in educational and family settings to think highly of themselves and be respectful of others, particularly women. Therefore, we need to encourage a type of masculinity that promotes individual responsibility, educational achievement and looking out for people, again, especially women. We should also be teaching our young boys in the classroom and at home not to objectify women, but to be much more like the moral, upstanding male role models that were in my life growing up. So as is espoused by lads need dads, give a young lad a good dad or a male role model, teach him what's right and what's wrong. Watch what he watches, and I cannot stress that enough. Watch what he watches and who his influences are. Teach him to be proud of what he is, a boy, because from this you will get a man that will be an asset to society, a fantastic son, a fantastic husband, and maybe even a fantastic dad. As a society, we should continue our pursuit of inclusiveness, but not so that policymakers forget half of society. 
It is important that if we get this right, we should need fewer police, not more. We should need fewer courts, not more. We should need fewer prisons, not more. This is a long game. We need to help men at all stages of their life. Some are already in a bad place, and we need to help these, but we need to prevent our next generation from following them. Addressing this disparity men and, young ba young many men and young boys face should be a long-term goal, which recognises that there will be no quick fixes here. But with a clear strategy, with the right people, good things can happen. Let's celebrate International Men Day each and every year by speaking men up and not talking them down. Speaking our sons and our dads, speaking well of our sons and our dads and our brothers and our husbands. Speak well of them, highlighting whenever you can their good points and not their bad. And trust me, you will watch them bloom. Bloom into someone who is an asset to society, someone you can rely on, someone you are proud of, and, who, and someone who is most of all a good man. Question is that this House has considered International Men's Day. Scott Benton. Thank you, Mr. Chalmer. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I congratulate my fellow Yorkshireman um, and honourable friend from Don Valley on a brilliant speech and the excellent work he does as a chair for the APPG for Men and Boys. Unfortunately, for far too long, men's issues have been swept under the carpet. The society focus on, focuses on the false narrative of male privilege. The very mention of men's issues will have hypocritical virtue signalers seething as they try to condemn wet white men as oppressors. No doubt people will sneer and ask why we even need an International Men's Day. However, the statistics on a number of key metrics are contrary to this popular misconception. The damning facts show that there are more male suicides, health outcomes are worse, and boys' attainment in education is below that of girls. As a former school teacher, I have seen firsthand how boys, and specifically disadvantaged white boys, fare far worse than their peers on all key attainment measures during their education. Earlier this year, the Education Committee came to the conclusion that there has been decades of neglect that which has let down white working-class children. There is, of course, no simple fix. But if we don't fully acknowledge and accept that this is a persistent and real issue, then a coordinated cross-departmental plan to target and reduce this educational gap in justice will never be achieved. A 2017 report from the University of Edinburgh highlighted that there are improved outcomes in education for boys who have a positive father figure, as well as improved mental health and lower levels of police contact. Men are too often run down and betrayed in society and the media, presented as villains or the butt of jokes rather than being shown as the positive role models they are. The promotion of traditional family values and male role models is vitally important. It has been suggested that one in ten fathers suffer mental health problems in the first few years of their baby's life and that many fathers do not speak out because they do not want to detract and take away attention from the health needs of their partner. Studies have shown that when men speak up and seek help, there has been a positive effect both for themselves and indeed for the child as well. Encouraging this would reduce the far too high number of children that are growing up having little or next to no contact with their father and the detrimental consequences that follow. All too often men do not seek the mental health support they need. Data shows that although men report lower levels of life satisfaction, they are less likely to access therapy, and despite reporting less suicidal thoughts, they are three times more likely to commit suicide. Men are also three times as likely to become dependent on alcohol or drugs, are more likely to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act, and more than eight out of ten rough sleepers are male, as my honourable friend has already mentioned. It must also be remembered that men can also be the victims of domestic violence and the statistics show that they are less likely to speak out about their suffering on this issue as well. 
Furthermore, men are more likely to be victims of violent crime in the UK, twice as likely to be murdered, and among children, boys are more likely than girls to become the victim of crime and violence. These statistics shine a light on the so-called reality of male privilege. Rather than campaigners undermining the role of men in our society in the name of equality and diversity, or leaving white working class boys at the bottom of the pile, we should be trying to raise opportunities and ambitions for all. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate on International Men's Day and to try and increase awareness of the challenges facing men. It is not a sign of weakness to ask for support, and I'd encourage men to access help when they need it. There are some fantastic initiatives and charities out there to provide help, including Elliot's Place in Blackpool, a sanctuary garden in memory of Elliot Taylor, who tragically took his own life in my constituency last year after battling with mental health problems. Action must be taken, and we cannot simply let this debate become an annual event and then gloss over the issues men are suffering until this time next year. These are challenges, there are challenges affecting men each and every day, and I hope that at next year's debate we can stand here celebrating some genuine progress and achievements. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Margaret Farrier. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Sharma, and it's always a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I would like to thank the Honourable Members for Don Valley and Shipley for securing this very important debate today for International Men's Day uh, last Friday. I know the Member for Shipley also sponsored last year's debate on this topic in the main chamber, and I know that he'll be really disappointed that he can't be here today, um, but I'm sure his ongoing commitment to men and boys' issues does not go unnoticed. As a society, we are becoming more aware of equalities issues, and today's debate is an opportunity to highlight those that impact men. This past year has been a watershed moment for women's rights, and rightly so in light of many recent events. But it's important to remember that there are issues that disproportionately impact on men too. I would also like to acknowledge that today is White Ribbon Day, founded by the White Ribbon Campaign, a global movement of men and boys working to end male violence against women and girls. It is in that spirit of solidarity we should remember that the fight for equality can only be won when that equality is given to all, regardless of gender. A few months ago, I met with Jason Schroeder, CEO of the Scottish Men's Shed Association, Men's Shed are an excellent example of a true grassroots movement. A men's shed is a space for men to come together, whatever their background, informally and voluntarily. They can come together for social or leisurely activities in a relaxed, zero-pressure environment. Perhaps most importantly, they are completely alcohol-free, unlike the vast majority of social spaces and activities aimed at men. I am proud to have the Rutherglen and Cambus Lang men shed in my constituency because their impact is invaluable. And I hope that all members will join me in thanking them for their contributions across Scotland and the UK. My con conversation with Jason was enlightening and his passion for the movement and the men involved is unquestionable. He explained how the sheds help men across a broad spectrum of ages and backgrounds and in innumerable ways. In particular, the support they provide for men who might be stigmatised for their mental health, employment status or suffering from things like alcoholism is vital. It was clear that there was a common thread tying many of the issues back to one big problem, isolation. Social isolation is an issue for men of all ages and it comes as a result of a variety of factors. The Joe Cox Commission on Loneliness found that 8 million men of all ages felt lonely once a week. Another 3 million said that they feel lonely on a daily basis. One in 10 men said they wouldn't want to admit to feeling lonely. That is a problem that needs addressing. Increased social inclusion can address a number of problems. Having a solid support network is key, but it can be hard to build even more so for men who live alone or who might have lost their support network under tragic circumstances 
or for men who suffer with conditions like depression and anxiety, which we already know are underdiagnosed because men are less likely to proactively seek diagnosis or support. Which brings me to another way men can be isolated through the healthcare system. Because men are more likely to internalise their feelings thanks to an outdated social stigma, there is a higher risk of mental health issues worsening. This can lead to self-medication and unhealthy coping mechanisms like alcohol or drug use. In turn, this leads to physical health issues, a deteriorating mental state and, sadly, feelings of overwhelming hopelessness and increased suicide rate. It isn't just mental health services men can struggle to access. Physical health literacy among men must also be improved. And social isolation makes men much harder to reach when it comes to preventative health care measures and early intervention. So will the Minister agree that further research should be done into how barriers to preventative health care can be overcome for men? And as we know, these issues are even starker when we look at men from ethnic minority backgrounds. Cultural differences can severely impact these men's ability to seek formal support, maybe for reasons stemming from their faith or just because of the taboo poor mental health carries in some communities. BAME men are more likely to grow up and live in impoverished areas where health services can be so oversubscribed they can't meet demand. Limage barriers can also present real logistical difficulties in accessing health care. And all of these issues can combine to make the very idea of seeking out support completely insurmountable. So will the government review the barriers to accessing health care for ethnic minorities? Each community has its own cultural taboos and stigmas. So will these be looked at in more detail so that support can be better tailored? And while we're on the topic of health, I would like to highlight the work of the Movember Foundation, who every November sets out to raise awareness of health issues like prostate and testicular cancer to increase early detection rates and effective treatment, mental wellbeing and suicide prevention. A movement born from a small group of men in Australia is now impacting the lives of men across the world. Another group of men that might find themselves socially isolated are single parents. One Parent Family Scotland, a charity that operates within my constituency, told me recently that while their services are predominantly accessed by women, they have seen a noticeable rise in single fathers seeking out help over the past 18 months. It's a position that is often overlooked and unsurprisingly as men make up only 10% of single parents. But think about what that might mean for that 10%. A lack of peers for a start. It goes back to my earlier point about the importance of a strong support network. Mother and baby groups are part and parcel of life for many single mothers. But a lot of fathers wouldn't feel comfortable going along and socialising at one where they might be the only man present. The prevailing belief in society that mothers should be the primary caregiver, problematic in itself, mean that single fathers face a raft of unfair assumptions. That very British stereotype of a stiff upper lip means that fathers may often not be seen as warm, loving or caring. If a child has a parent that loves them and does their very best for them, that's all that should matter. This debate is so important and I'm happy that that's been recognised here today. I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to speak and I hope that through discussions like this, we can work towards a society that is truly equal and fair for all. Thank you. Maria Miller. Thank you, Mr. Sharman. It's a great pleasure, as always, to serve under your chairmanship. And can I start by commending my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, for his opening speech in this debate. And whilst we deeply miss the honourable member for Shipley, and we always will in debates like this, he, was, he did an extremely good job in opening uh, this important debate. And also, very good to hear from my honourable friend, the member for Blackpool South as well. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, Mr uh, Chairman, that we have two men from Yorkshire and two members from Scotland in this debate today, and maybe um, we need to spread our geography a little bit wider. Um, I'm here as the token member from Hampshire talking about these issues, but I'm sure other colleagues from Hampshire would want to be there here if their diary is allowed. Um, I'm particularly pleased to follow the Honourable Member for Rutherglen uh, Rutherglen and Hamilton West, 
um, because she's raised a number of issues there in her speech which I think are incredibly powerful, particularly the issue of social isolation that men can feel, uh, not only uh, if they're single parents, but as she alluded to, uh, as they get older. And um, I visited around the country a number of men's shed projects, which were particularly good at uh, reaching out to men who are older uh, to um, enable them to understand better, perhaps, the importance of comradeship. Um, in, in older age and I applaud particularly the men shed in my own community that does so much in this area. Um, Mr Sharma, on the 19th of uh, November we celebrated International Men's Day um, as a way of recognising the positive values that men bring to our society and our families and our communities um, and I have to celebrate the, the men in my life. I hope you allow me to do that Mr Sharma. My father who was a self-made businessman uh, my husband, who is a highly successful lawyer, my two brothers, who were very successful in their own family lives, and, of course, my two sons, one of whom was born on International Women's Day. So he's had to endure me referencing him uh, for, well, 15 years now at, in International Women's Day, so I'm glad to be able to reference him now in International Men's Day. Um, and he is uh, a highly successful young man just embarking on his university career. Um, and I think this debate continues to be incredibly important because with the advent of shared parental leave, the rights to request flexible working for everyone and equal marriage for same-sex couples, all of which have come in in the last 10 years, I don't think British men have ever had more opportunity to be able to challenge some of the really negative gender stereotypes that have been alluded to already in the debate today. Um, but can I gently say that men need to find their voice? We have three gentlemen here, uh, honourable members here today, who are uh, taking time out of their busy schedules to be part of this important debate. And indeed, our honourable member, uh, friend, the member for Shipley, would have been here if his diary had allowed him. But people, and particularly male leaders in our community, need to be prepared to speak out and to challenge status quos that they feel are not right. And I was really privileged last Friday evening to be at an event which was actually organised by a constituent of mine regarding uh, the importance of challenging uh, ethnic stereotypes. And uh, at that event, one of my councillors talked about the importance to him of the changes that had happened in our society that affected gay men and the importance that gay men can now uh, have a marriage in the same way as anybody else can, uh, that they can adopt children, and the incredible way in which our society has adapted and changed. And I don't think we should forget that in our debate today. But still, there is much more to do. Because when we turn on the television, turn on the radio, we hear stereotypes in the media, online, in advertising, that portray men as as if they may be failing if they aren't a dominating male breadwinner or if they've experienced family breakdown or if they've been made redundant through no fault of their own uh, where issues of consent and intimate relationships can feel very complex and even frightening for young men. So I think International Men's Day is a real opportunity for us to voice some of these issues to really challenge that but I would be urging all members of parliament, but particularly the men, to see their important role in doing this in their own community. Because the pressure of stereotypes, um, I think, could be very closely linked to the issue that the Honourable Lady talked about earlier, which is the, the prevalence of suicide amongst men, which is a devastating impact, not just on a family, but on a whole community when it happens, and is disproportionately likely to happen to men, because suicide is the biggest killer of men under the age of 50, with those aged 20 to 59 at the highest risk, as well as people who are LGBT or trans. And last year in England, 75% of all suicides were men, with a, a figure similarly high or higher across the UK. And that's what's even more worrying is the gap between men and women, um, and that has increased over time. Now, we can all pay a part in dis uh, dismantling the stigma around mental health uh, and, as the Honourable Lady was talking about, supporting men to be able to access 
uh, medical support more easily and particularly mental health support and it's really important that we do this because although men report lower levels of uh, satisfaction with their lives which I think is startling enough according to the government's national well-being survey NHS data shows that they're less likely to access psychological talking therapies for even common mental health problems and this inequity of access is something that the minister really um, I hope can take away from this debate today because it affects all of us who have men in our families um, and we don't want them to feel as if these aren't things that they can access themselves and by having open and honest conversations with our uh, family and friends, we can remind the men in our lives that they aren't alone. Um, and I'm pleased that the government have already invested £57 million in suicide prevention through the NHS long-term plan. But I hope that this is part of a, a bigger plan of supporting men to be able to uh, access the sort of mental health support that they need. Um, there's also, as I think the Honourable Member for Blackpool South uh, uh, talked about in his speech, uh, many organisations that can help anyone experiencing distress or anxiety or feeling low. Um, and I would encourage anybody to visit the Every Mind Matters website and gov.uk for advice and particularly practical steps that they can support their wellbeing um, and manage any mental health problems. Um, and I'd also perhaps like to take the opportunity to highlight the fantastic uh, mental health services and suicide prevention organisations like Mind, Calm and Rethink um, who are doing incredible work uh, as, alongside organisations like the Samaritans. Men face many challenges in society. Uh, the Honourable Member for Don Valley talked about attainment le levels in education. Um, and high levels of prostate cancer, higher levels of absence from family life, high levels of rough sleeping and difficulties in reoffending. And these are incredibly complex issues, which is why I'm glad we're able to shine a light on them today um, and look at how they disproportionately affect men. Um, I'll spend the rest of my time in, in the debate today talking about one of the themes in International Men's Day this year, which is better relations between men and women, something we're always striving for in my household, Mr Sharma. Um, this is a very simple concept, but it encapsulates the core action that's needed to achieve and embrace equality and, and that we can lift each other up. Um, I'm particularly keen to press for better relations to be fostered and strengthened online because too often we hear about cases of abuse between men and women, often with behaviour that would be difficult to comprehend in the offline world, appearing to be um, every day in the online world. Um, so I'm hoping that the online safety bill uh, that's coming up hopefully shortly, uh, we'll be able to address some of these issues. For instance, the government's own research found that there is a substantial link, uh, evidential link, between the use of pornography by adult men and harmful sexual attitudes and behaviours towards women. Now, studies are also revealing that the algorithms of porn websites have been actively promoting sexual violence and even illegal pornography, with one in eight video titles on the home pages of porn sites promoting this content. Now, it's not right that tech companies should be fueling division between men and women in their algorithms. So I hope this is something that will be addressed within the online safety bill. Uh, practices like image-based abuse uh, uh, primarily affect women, but can affect men too, um, and can thwart men and women from having healthy relationships and respect for one another. And this is an attitudinal problem that trickles down to cultures between boys and girls in school, as was evidenced in the recent Ofsted report on sexual abuse uh, at schools. It's with the combined strength of men and women that we'll be able to create a fairer online world and create fairer workplaces and fairer communities. And we should be working together on this. Um, I'd like to thank by ending the inspirational men, not just in my life, but in my whole community, who've been helping to tackle the inequalities and challenges that men are facing um, and for the way that they're working with women to create a stronger and fairer society. And I hope that perhaps, Mr Sharma, in future debates, more male colleagues in this place will find time to come and find their voice on these issues. 
Um, I know that we have huge support amongst male colleagues for the many debates we have on women's issues in this place. Uh, but I wish that they would also find uh, perhaps a voice to talk about the issues they face as well. And, and in by doing that, uh, we can find the right solutions for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Gavin Newland. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sharma. It's a, a pleasure to, to serve. And Dean, can I start by commending the member for uh, Don Valley for securing debate and, um, and indeed his opening speech? Although there was one point I think I maybe I misunderstood him, but he, he mentioned a number of TV shows. I'm not sure if he was meaning it. Queen Latifah taking over the role of um, equaliser from Edward Woodward and now Denzel Washington. And a strong female character was a negative uh, when, I, when I see that as, as a positive myself. I have to say, um, I enjoyed the opening speech a lot more than I enjoyed um, his colleague's speech um, for Blackpool South. Um, I disagreed fundamentally, certainly with the opening uh, remarks. Uh, uh, I remember for Rutherglen Hamilton West uh, mentioned, uh, as, as others have had the Men's, the Men's Shed organisation, uh, and I've met the Men's Shed in my local area, and they are a, a fantastic um, group. And she, she made some very fair points, I feel, on, um, on male single parents uh, as well. Uh, and the, the former chair of the, of the Equalities um, Select Committee mentioned one of the themes of International Men's Day, uh, better relations between uh, men and women, and, and that she sought better relations in their own house. Uh, well, I'm completely outnumbered and surrounded by women and girls in my house. Even the cat's a girl uh, in, in my house, so I have no, uh, no say whatsoever uh, in my house. But, uh, and I agree with much of that has been said on the likes of men's mental health, uh, suicide rates, social isolation, uh, and men's health in general. But I have to say, I believe that these all merit their own debates where we can drill down uh, in detail on the issues involved. They are very serious issues, issues that we've probably not shone a big enough light on in this place, uh, um, and they deserve more attention, not just in this place, but in society at large. But this is where some, at least some of my consensual remarks uh, end, because I believe internet. Uh, International Men's Day is anathema to me. I think it's a, it's a rather cruel joke concocted in response to feminism, women's rights and International Women's Day. And to, to me, at least, and this is my personal view, International Days um, are usually for the oppressed, the underprivileged or, or those facing inequality. It, it's shameful in 2021, International Women's Day is still all too necessary and even sadder that International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls is even more important than ever. And I have to say that it's the bitterest of ironies that this men's debate takes place today on that day. It's also called uh, White Ribbon Day, and which marks the start of 16 days of activism. But I do want to state that uh, the vast majority of people involved in International Men's Day, particularly here in the UK, are doing so for the very best uh, of reasons, and I pay tribute to what they're setting out to do. I don't want any of them to think uh, that, that my negative comments cast any aspersions uh, whatsoever onto them, but I have a, just a fundamental problem with the day itself. But I do want to briefly address one of the substantive issues raised by members, uh, because the, the Scottish Government is taking action to tackle uh, the issues impacting uh, men and boys in particular. This includes the ongoing work on improving mental health support and preventing suicide, which I think every member has um, spoken about. The Public Health Scotland figures state that there are 805 probable suicides registered in Scotland in 2020, which is a decrease from 833 in 2019, but just under three quarters, a similar rate as far as I'm aware to, uh, to the rest of the UK. 71.4% of, of the people who died by suicide in 2020 were male. Uh, that's uh, the highest crude rate of suicides for males occurs in the 35 to 44 age bracket. And there is regional disparity within Scotland as well. The, the further north you go, the higher uh, the rate of suicide is, with Orkney, the highest um, at 19.3 deaths per 100,000, and 18.9 in the Highlands, compared with 14 uh, for the whole country. And as we know, these suicides occur for, sadly, occur for a whole variety of reasons, but uh, sexual identity, societal and cultural conditioning and role models all play a role. So this says a lot about the psychology, behaviour and mental health of men in our communities. The Scottish Government published Scotland's Mental Health Transition and Recovery Plan last year, which prioritised uh, rapid and easily accessible support for those in distress 
and ensures safe, effective treatment and care of people living with mental illness, uh, long-term physical health conditions or disabilities. Because between 2002 and 2006, in 2013 2017, the rate of death by suicide in Scotland fell by 20%. And under these current plans, the target is to further reduce the rate of suicide by another 20%. Now, I want to go on and talk about MEND achievements, um, although I doubt that there will be the kind of achievements that some members will want talked about today. And I'm not sure the member for Blackpool South will, um, will be keen on my following remarks. But it's fairly easy to make sure men's achievements are celebrated regularly when the, the, essentially the entirety of Western society has been run for the convenience and security of men over women since, since literally God was a boy. Uh, of course, that has also meant that men's other achievements, the ones that aren't so positive, are also pushed down uh, the pecking order. Uh, the femicide census published last year found that over 1,400 women and girls killed by men in the decade starting, 2000, uh, starting 2009. And we know that high-profile cases that for whatever reason, often very good reason, capture the headlines, which Sarah Everard, Sabina Nessa, Nicole Smallman, etc., etc. But they're the tragic tip of a much larger iceberg of endemic male violence against females. 92% of defendants in domestic abuse related prosecutions are male. 84% of victims relating to sexual offences are female. One in three teenage girls have, have experienced some form of sexual violence from their partner and one in five have experienced it since the age of 16. And, inst and on that, incidentally, can I thoroughly recommend uh, that members watch the BBC Three documentary by Zara McDermott on rape culture and sexism in our schools, which I watched last night. It is essential viewing. Of course, I'll give you. I think no statistics proves the fact that this is why we should have an International Men's Day and we should speak men up instead of continually pulling them down. As, as I said in my speech, the vilifying of men, continually expecting them to fail, makes this situation worse, not better. What we should be doing is putting, with the help of the government, we should be helping families, helping young men and helping men to live good lives where they feel valued, where they don't feel isolated, and where they're actually proud to be men, instead of actually having to cover up all the time and feel awful for being, for being men. If we actually celebrated men, and we said that you can do good things, and you are able to do good things, and you are a good person, then I think you'd see those cystics that you spoke about, which are absolutely dreadful, but you would see those cystics actually fall. Let's talk positively instead of negatively about men all the time. Yeah, thank you, Richard. I thank the member for that intervention. I've got a lot of sympathy with, with, with the elements of uh, the point he was making, um, but in my view, before we get to that, we need men in general to take responsibility for what men have, have done and continue to do. We see it in our our papers and our news bulletins day in and day out. We need to take responsibility and we need to stop this at source. It's up to us to not walk on by and allow abuse or anything of that nature uh, to happen in, in the streets and dressing rooms. I've played rugby for 17 years. I've, I've heard plenty of sexism and misogyny um, in, in that time. Um, and, and being completely honest, for, for those 17 years were younger, I probably didn't say a thing about it either. Um, but this is what we need to change. So. Whilst I accept this, the, the premise of, of the Honourable Member's point, I think we need to first get to a state of acceptance first and take responsibility for, uh, that we should um, for the issue um, at hand. Because it is us, it is men uh, who are overwhelmingly responsible for the violence and misery suffered by millions of our families, our friends, our colleagues. Misery they suffer purely because they are women. Uh, frankly, I'm pig sick of hearing unadulterated mints about how hard done by men are becoming as we've heard in this debate as well. But we aren't the ones afraid to go out on the streets, um, especially after dark. Uh, this time of year, effectively keeping many women prisoners in their own home. We aren't the ones uh, who are outnumbered two to one in this place and who have had the right to vote for this place on the same basis as men for less than a century. We aren't the ones still after 50 years after the Equal Pay Act sitting at the sharp end of that gender pay gap. It isn't women who are setting these pay rates under 40% of FTSE 100 board members are women, and only eight of those companies are headed by women. I wouldn't, I'll complete the point and I'll let him, in, I'll let him back in. Yep. I wouldn't for a moment suggest that if these boardrooms suddenly looked a bit more like a gender balance in wider society, we would suddenly see an outbreak of pay rises and better terms and conditions, because big business will always be big business. But as men, we should accept our part and our responsibility to maintain the state's quo. And I'll give you again. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, 
Just, just going on about um, how women are not doing as well as men, I did just pull some statistics just before this debate, especially in Doncaster, just to see where we are. Um, 27, of female, 27 out of the 32 um, heads of uh, primary schools, female. Um, four out of the seven um, secondary school heads, uh, female. Chief Constable for South Yorkshire, female. Doncaster District Commander, uh, Chief Superintendent, uh, female. Senior Coroner, female. South Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Chief Officer and Chief Executive, female. Chief Executive of Ardash, female. DMBC Directors, two, two female, three male. Assistant Directors, nine female, four male. Elected Mayor, female. Opposition Council Leader, female. Chair of Board of Doncaster Basketball Trust Hospital, <laughs> female. President, do you want me to come on? So I think the, I think the idea that women are completely, it's just completely and utterly, it's, it's, not, it's definitely not correct. Gavin Newland. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sharma. Um, well, all it says, all that, that proves that it can be done. So that, I presume he's talking about his local area, his constituency and his, his local authority and what have you. Um, that's, that sounds fantastic. But these are the overall figures for the entire country. So whilst there might be a, a pocket of equality in, in, in our members' part of the world, that simply doesn't uh, bear any scrutiny when you look at it from a nationwide point of view. Because um, I stand by the stats that I have... Uh, just stated. But International Men's Day should be in part about us all reflecting on our own behaviours and attitudes, and it is, um, and those of our peers. The patriarchy was not created out of thin air. It's a product of, of how we and our forefathers have viewed the world and women's place in it in relation to men. That place has been for far too long in the second class section of society. And some of those behaviours and attitudes were on uh, display here when it came to ratifying the Istanbul Convention. Now, the Istanbul Convention is a gold standard in preventing violence against women and girls, and I campaigned uh, pretty hard on the issue, indeed speaking about it uh, during my debate on, in this place on men's role in ending violence against women and girls. And I was thoroughly delighted when my colleague at the time, uh, Ayla Wakeford, uh, was able to make ratification a statutory obligation of this government. But Mr Chairman, we're now coming up on the fifth anniversary of the second reading of that bill, uh, and we still haven't ratified uh, the convention. Of course... I will remember that day a certain MP speaking for well over an hour attempting to talk out a bill aimed at making sure the UK met its international obligations and its obligations to women and girls. It's also the kind of behaviour that confirms for many that the attitudes that pervade those at the top of society haven't changed much over the decades. When that same member says, I don't believe there's an issue between men and women while speaking at a conference for an organisation that issues awards for lying feminist of the month, it simply speaks to a wider perception that there is a serious width of misogyny and hardcore sexism about this place. And for the avoidance of doubt, Mr Sharma, uh, that the member I speak of is the Honourable Member for Shipley, who originally helped uh, co-sponsored today's de debate. And to say that in itself, to me, somewhat undermined uh, what many who support International Men's Day were hoping to achieve with this debate is, a, is an understatement. And yes, I have emailed the Honourable Member, given he's not here today, um, to let him know I was going to reference him. If that was what you were about to say, uh, Mr Sharma. Uh, if you could keep your speech related to the men's day, uh, not the violence I'm, of the girls. I'm moving, I'm moving past that. Yeah. A very brief mention of it. Um, but I know that the perceived uh, sexist attitudes uh, are not held by the majority of members in this place. And I think it falls to us to say that these kinds of uh, Antediluvian attitudes don't represent us and don't represent how uh, I hope our governments and civil society think. Uh, but if we're here to talk about International, international Men's Day, yes, before I conclude. Thank you, Member, for giving way, and he's certainly making some interesting comments. <laughs> I thought you might think that. <laughs> In terms of the advancement of women in politics, it's brilliant um, to see the numbers of female MPs in this place has risen so starkly since 1997. And of course, that has been replicated in Scottish Parliament too, where, of course, we have a female um, SNP leader. Um, more broadly, he was also speaking about um, some of the um, negative um, effects men have had in society, particularly in and around sexual violence against women. On that point, I just wondered what impact he thinks the purported actions of the previous leader of his party have had in terms of the confidence of women and girls in Scotland coming forward to report issues. 
Um, I'm not really sure I'm going to dignify that with a response, Mr Sharma. It's, it, it's for that person um, to justify his or her his actions, um, and there's been plenty of court cases uh, on that issue. It's not for me. I'm not going to stand here and defend um, anyone on that basis. But if we are here to talk about International Men's Day, which I hope you were hoping I was going to get back on to, um, let's talk about the full achievements of men. Like, centuries of... Um, subjugating and blittering half the population um, and obviously having to be dragged kicking and screaming to allow uh, w or give women the vote. We also looked, and again I appreciate this is all very negative, I'm looking backwards, but my point is we need to accept the reality and far too many men still don't accept the reality and accept responsibility um, for these actions and I think we need to look backwards and accept this before we can move forward, but actions like locking single mothers up in homes uh, with their babies until the right adoptive parents come along, at which point the male run, the male run state forced these mothers to sign over their own children, not once or twice, but hundreds of thousands of times across these aisles. Yes, there are issues and challenges specific to men which must be highlighted and tackled. The attainment gap in education, the low life expectancies linked to poorer health and care, the huge human cost of prison and recidivism. But let's not pretend the balance sheet is not tipped hugely in favour of men and against women. That culture and the deeply ingrained structures in society contribute to a toxic masculinity that is to the detriment of both men and women. And that talks, yes, of course. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I just wanted to reiterate to him. I, I don't think this is a zero-sum game, is it? It doesn't have to be that, that that women are gaining or losing at the expense of men. We can have a situation where actually we want to improve the lives of of women and improve the lives of men, um, because I, I think that in do, in taking that approach, uh, we might come to a better solution. I, I hear what the Honourable Member says, and she obviously speaks with a great deal of knowledge with her background uh, in government and in, and in committee. However, I have stressed the point before that um, whilst I accept the premise of the point she, she has just made, um, that there are far too many people in society and indeed in this place who still can't accept the reality of the situation. And until that is the case, um, then I think we can't really move on in exactly the spirit that the Honourable Member, or sorry, right Honourable Member, <laughs> um, suggests. And, and that's my central point. But um, so once we get to a, a point of acceptance, then, then of, of course we have to move forward and lockstep and improve like everyone, uh, lives for everyone um, together. Um, but that, uh, that is a toxic combination. Um, but we are gradually moving to a model of families and households that treats one partner as in, uh, moving, sorry, moving beyond <laughs> a model of families and households that treats one partner as inferior towards one and where gender roles are ignored. Uh, and I welcome the progress governments both north and south of the border uh, on expanding free early years of learning and, and childcare, um, although I would say our colleagues down south have some way to catch up. Um, this is helping to reshape the expectations of family life towards a more equitable um, set up, and this has been helped by changes in attitudes and talent to paternity leave. Um, but we're not going to change, to conclude, um, we're not going to change this country's culture and gain ingrained attitudes overnight, but we can make significant changes that can help women and help men redefine their positions and their place in the world. Uh, a transformational boost in paternity leave would be one of those changes, and I hope the Minister uh, will take that back to her department uh, for further study. Uh, but I chair the All Party Group. Um, on White Ribbon, and I'm proud to be an ambassador for both White Ribbon UK and White Ribbon Scotland, uh, whose badge I'm, I'm wearing today. And that campaign, which was referenced already by the Honourable Member for Rutherglen and Hamilton West, was set up in the wake of a horrific massacre in Montreal, where a self-identified anti-feminist murdered 14 women in cold blood. But that was in 1989. Uh, decades later, we're still seeing that toxic masculinity embed itself in large parts of society with the rise of the incel movement. But what Link sees is a learned behaviour of men and boys towards women and girls, and that behaviour and the social cues and norms that back it up have to be challenged by men, all of us. And we have to acknowledge the wrongs we've per perpetrated in women for, <laughs> for millennia, and that each do our bit to, right, to roll those wrongs back for the future. So the fight for gender equality needs action at the top from our governments, our employers, our businesses and our public services, but it also needs individual action from every one of us to tell our friends when their behaviour is unacceptable, to tell our colleagues when their actions 
while perhaps unintended or unknowing, are helping continue the cycle of disrespect. And if International Men's Day is to be something worth commemorating each year, it should be as a reflection and acknowledgement of the damage and human suffering <clears throat> that our place uh, versus that of women has caused and is still causing. It should be at a time when we come together to discuss and debate how best to change our own behaviours to support women and build a better, more equal and fairer society. Annalise Dodds. Thank you, uh, Mr Sharman. It's a real pleasure to be speaking uh, with you in the chair. Sorry, whoops, a little bit of an earring disaster going on there. Anyway, I will continue. Let me begin by, of course, congratulating the Honourable Member for Don Valley for opening this debate and all of those members who've contributed to such an interesting discussion that I think we've had over the last hour. As the Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities, I want to stress how important it is to me and my party that we address inequalities wherever we may find them and however they manifest themselves. We'll never, as a country or a society, be able to truly flourish if we aren't enabling all of our people to access opportunities and fulfil their potential, whatever their background is. And as we've all heard this afternoon, for too many men in our country, that is not always possible. And I have to say, for many men, that's become harder over the last 10 years. And I do want to begin with one of the starkest statistics of all that's been referred to by a number of people who've talked uh, within this debate, which uh, is that uh, very disturbing figure that men are now three times more likely to commit suicide than women. That gap has grown over time, as has been mentioned. And we must all, I believe, ask ourselves what more we can do to support those men who feel they've lost all hope and how we can reduce that awful figure. And now part of the answer advocated by specialists in this field and indeed referred to uh, uh, by members in this debate, member for Rutherglen and Hamilton West and the Right Honourable member for Basingstoke, part of the answer surely is to break down stereotypes that might make it harder for some men to talk about their mental health. And I would want to add my praise to those different organisations that work on this, the Men's Shed, Project, also Mind Rethink, Samaritan, so many others who do tremendous work here, including, of course, many volunteers who support those organisations. Um, another part of the solution, though, is ensuring we have better provision of mental health services overall. And that's more important than ever, given the dreadful waiting list that we have around mental health support in many parts of our country. I'm sure that all members in this debate will be aware of that. They will have seen that in their post bags, quite how long those waiting lists are now. And of course, my party, the Labour Party, has said that we would act very strongly to reverse that trend, to ensure there was mental health treatment within a month for everyone who needs it. A distant dream for so many men and women across our country currently, and that we would hire it 1,500 new staff so that a million new people could access treatment by the end of our first term in office. Now it's also clear from the debate this afternoon that we need early action to prevent the problems that some men and boys face from arising in the first place or getting worse over time. And I, I think we do need a serious discussion uh, about this. Um, I found some of the debate a little bit confusing, perhaps reflecting some of the confusion um, reflected by the member for Paisley and Renfrewshire North. I probably misheard um, a suggestion that, for example, discussions around who should be the next 007 was a reason for boys potentially turning to a life of crime. I think it's a far more complex situation, surely, uh, than suggesting there's that easy read-off um, uh, from different cultural uh, discussions uh, of that type. Uh, we do know um, that in education, boys tend to perform worse than girls. We've had a discussion about that in this debate, both at the end of primary school, uh, with 60% of boys reaching the standard expected of them compared to 70% of girls, but also at the end of the GCSE year, where 75% of girls achieve at least a grade four in both English and maths compared to 69% of boys. And we also know that boys are three times more likely to be excluded from school than girls, something that causes, I know, tremendous concern to many people. And addressing those disparities 
does require early and sustained intervention. It's very concerning, of course, that we have seen the removal of those Sure Start centres that did provide that early intervention for so many families supporting them, and also that we haven't seen that sustained programme for education catch-up that is so necessary, with many boys and girls, of course, missing out on the support that they need. Um, my party has called for a proper catch-up plan and also for a catch-up for children's social skills as well. That's why we said there needs to be uh, breakfast clubs for all uh, children provided as an element of catch-up, something that has not, of course, happened. We also then need early intervention when it comes to addressing men's health issues. There's a number of concerns here that have been indeed articulated during this debate. Um, of course, it's particularly important around those male-specific cancers and overall cancer incidence is 24% higher uh, for men than for women. Um, we also find that more men are overweight or obese than women. Almost 14,000 more men died from heart disease in 2020 than women. Um, and I have to say I'm also particularly concerned by the, uh, obviously by the extent of drug-related deaths um, across the UK, um, but also there are very, very stark uh, gender disparities there as well. Men are far more likely um, to be dying from drug-related deaths. And, of course, that rate has been very disturbingly going up in our country, particularly strongly, uh, worryingly, in Scotland. So we must uh, deal with that. And what these very stark statistics show is ultimately the need for a proper public health strategy focused on acting early to support people so they can nip problems in the bud, live healthily and get the care that they need. And of course, we've seen substantial cuts to public health budgets, which mean that before the pandemic, only half of all adults over 40 in England were attending the regular health checks that had been introduced by a Labour government in 2009, particularly important, of course, for those men who may not be proactively seeking that support for their health. They're especially important when it comes to spotting disease early on, not least cardiovascular disease. So to address the problems that we've heard about this afternoon, we need to turn the tide on rising health inequalities and improve health for men, indeed for everyone, by tackling problems at source and considering health not just as a standalone policy issue, but one that's embedded in and impacted by everything that government does. But Mr Sharma, we also need to consider these issues at a more detailed level than just speaking about an overall category of men and boys, because in the three areas that I've just highlighted, male suicide, educational attainment and men's health, we know full well that, of course, not all men and boys are affected in the same way. There are other deep-rooted inequalities overlaid on those worrying trends. Uh, the government's own suicide prevention strategy from 2012, for example, highlighted that gay and bisexual men are at a higher risk of experiencing suicidal ideation, self-harm and substance misuse. And as well as the educational attainment gap between boys and girls, we know that there's an even starker divide between children from poorer backgrounds and their wealthier peers, with secondary school children on free school meals 18 months behind by the time that they take their GCSEs. When it comes to health, in some areas of the country, life expectancy, disturbingly, is actually falling. Obviously, that's something not taking place in many other countries, but it is happening in our country with the largest decreases seen in the most deprived 10% of neighbourhoods in the northeast of England, while the largest increases in life expectancy have been seen in the least deprived 10% of neighbourhoods in London. So we need to look at these inequalities in the round. We need a government that's committed to addressing all of them. And it's that holistic, ambitious approach that will ultimately improve life for everyone in our country, men and boys included. Um, Chair, let me finish uh, with your permission by mentioning the fact that a number of others have drawn attention to that while we're discussing International Men's Day, which of course fell last week, we're doing so on uh, November the 25th, which happens to be White Ribbon Day, a day when men across our country are called on to make a promise that they will never commit, excuse or remain silent about male violence against women. And I think the comments... Uh, from the Right Honourable Member for Basingstoke about online harms were very important in this context. We really need to see 
that strong reform. We need to see internet companies taking strong action uh, against online harms uh, against women and girls. And also, of course, we need to see strong action against uh, other forms uh, of violence as well, including domestic violence. Yesterday's truly appalling statistics showed that the overall levels of domestic abuse have doubled in the last five years. I'm slowing down because I think that's such an appalling state of affairs, doubled in the last five years. Three quarters of domestic homicide victims were women. Um, and it would be remiss of me not to mention that we are in the midst of an epidemic of violence against uh, women and girls in this country. And sadly, that epidemic is not being dealt with effectively by government. Charges and prosecutions have actually dropped year on year over the last five years. They've been getting worse. Uh, and the member uh, for Don Valley, I have to say, um, seemed to suggest at various points, and I'm sure that he didn't mean this, but it sounded a bit like he was suggesting there was some kind of a trade-off between celebrating the achievements of men and boys, which I'm sure we'd all want to do, as against taking action uh, against violence against women and girls. There's no trade-off, of course. We must do both. Um, and I'm sure that he didn't mean to suggest that in his remarks, even if inadvertently. We must all take that action against forms of violence against women and girls. And so I do hope that all will be listening to the messages from that very important white ribbon campaign today um, and all uh, acting to make sure that we also, in every action we take in this place, celebrate the achievements of everyone in our country, including boys and men. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Sharma, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I thank my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, for securing this debate and for his ongoing work to ensure that the issues faced by men and boys aren't neglected. As chair of the Men and Boys APPG, he headed up the publication of the report A Boy Today, which is essential reading on the barriers many boys and men face in today's society. So I'd like to thank him and all the members of the APPG for their work and thank all those who contributed to the valuable uh, report. And I think we're now in the seventh year of marking the day with a debate, illustrating the importance of the event to all of us here. And it's not just important in this house, of course, with over, with over 400 organizations across the UK taking part this year. I think loose women even became loose men, if only for one day. So remember, for Don Valley should know that these, um, these swapsies do happen uh, a, a, across the board. I want to thank everyone for their thoughtful contributions to the debate, um, and also the shadow minister in particular for the spirit uh, in which she conducted this debate. We've highlighted the wide-ranging areas we need to continue to make progress on if we are to achieve equality for everyone, the areas in which we agree and the areas in which we disagree. Uh, the member for Don Valley spoke quite movingly about the issues men and boys face, and I'd like him to know that I agree with him that we must not pathologize masculinity or any other protected uh, characteristic. Men and women are not in competition with each other, and our vision of equality is one where both sexes thrive and succeed, not one at the expense of the other. Um, if the, uh, if, if honourable members will indulge me, I would like to talk a bit about COVID because I've spent, I feel I've spent quite a lot of the last years uh, uh, working on it. It has been, 2021 has been another year dominated by COVID, which has a huge impact on us all. And we both know, and we know that both the health and economic impacts of the pandemic have not been felt equally by everyone. Being male is the single biggest risk factor for COVID after age and men have seen higher redundancy rates over the course of the pandemic. But men are not one homogenous group with one shared experience, and it would be ridiculous to treat them as though they were. And that's why we focused our efforts on ensuring support gets to those who need it most, and we will continue to do that as a successful rollout of the vaccine and booster shots uh, progresses. We are also determined to ensure COVID doesn't have a lasting impact on children's education. So the member for Oxford East, uh, she mentioned uh, educational catch-up. No doubt she'll be pleased to know that we have set up the National Tutoring Programme to help schools access targeted support for those hardest hit by the disruption. And over the next three years, we expect the National Tutoring Programme to deliver 90 million hours of tuition across the country, which will particularly benefit those in more deprived areas, including white working class boys, which I know is of concern to members on all sides of the House, as evidenced by the recent Education Select Committee report. 
Uh, the member for Blackpool uh, South spoke about one in ten fathers suffering mental health issues, and I send my condolences to him and the family of his constituent, Elliot Taylor, uh, and the very tragic uh, circumstances of his death. This is an issue we take very seriously. The challenges we have faced over the past year have shown the importance of taking care of our mental health and that of those around us. We know the value of asking for help when we need it, and sadly, we also know that some men are more reluctant to do so. The government's national suicide prevention strategy highlights men, and especially middle-aged men uh, and young men, as a group at high risk of suicide. My right honourable friend, the member for Basingstoke, mentioned the government investing an additional £57 million in suicide prevention by 2023-24 through the NHS long-term plan, which includes funding to reduce male suicide. She'll be pleased to know that's not all we're doing. We're also providing an extra £5 million this financial year, specifically to support voluntary and community sector organisations working to prevent suicide. We have ensured that the suicide prevention funding for local areas is used to test different approaches to reaching and engaging men. Despite all this work, we are not complacent. We must all do more to encourage men to seek help, and we must ensure we listen more closely to those that do. I would urge any man who is struggling to speak to a GP uh, to seek out mental health support delivered by charities or the NHS. And I am grateful to the member for Rutherglen for highlighting the work of charities such as Men's Shed and Movember and the need to remove barriers which prevent men from seeking help. And I'm sure my colleagues in DHSC would be very happy to hear from her on work which could, uh, more work which could be done in um, this space. Uh, several members mentioned stereotypes and role models, uh, and I agree with the arguments made. Not only can stereotypes prevent some people from seeking help when they need it, they can also limit people's aspirations in school. Capable young boys can be held back from reaching their potential. We see this, for example, when young men say they want to work in the care sector or with children, when too many people around them act surprised or laugh. A 2017 report suggests that 46% of men aged 18 to 30 feel that society tells them it is not good for a boy to be taught how to cook, so clean the house or take care of children. And the, uh, the member for Rutherglen made an excellent point about the stigma surrounding what men should be uh, seen to be doing. Uh, so we should all counter these messages when we see them so that young men, as well as young women, can make the most of all the opportunities available. And uh, this highlights the importance of role models. The member for Don Valley praised the organisation uh, Lads Needs That... Lads need dads, uh, for example, and I pay tribute to their good work. Unfortunately, there is no shortage of positive role models in public life, including those here today, as well as in business, but these sectors haven't always represented the full diversity of men in the country. And I am pleased we're making progress so that young boys who may be LGBT, disabled, or from working class backgrounds, can also see people who look and sound like them in public life. Aspirations shouldn't be determined by who you are or where you live, but by your talents, and abilities. Um, and the member for, uh, the, uh, my right honourable friend, the member for Basingstoke, raised the very, very important point about the online safety bill and its role in tackling the promotion of sexual violence through pornography. She and I agree that the um, online world is a place where very harmful stereotypes uh, are reinforced, and I'm certain she will be working with the government to help us uh, tackle, tackle this issue. Uh, the member for Shipley is not here, and I'm afraid I didn't tell him I was going to mention him, but I suspect he would be very concerned if I didn't mention the issue of family courts and parental alienation, which uh, we haven't uh, touched on too much in this debate. But he is right uh, when he highlights that, uh, unfortunately, not all families are happy ones, but a child's welfare is best served by the continued involvement of both parents, provided that involvement is safe. We know that parents can face difficulties when attempting to spend time with their children after a separation, Sometimes this is because of the obstructive behaviour of the parents the child spends most of their time with. Family courts recognise the problems this can cause, as does the draft statutory guidance of the Domestic Violence Act, which highlights parental alienation as an example of coercive and controlling behaviour for the very first time. And I thank the Honourable Member uh, for Shipley for his work here, which will ensure more children benefit from contact with both parents. One of the themes for this year's International Men's Day celebrations is better relations between men and women. And this reflects the government's equalities work. It is not about pitting one deserving group against another. It's about ensuring everyone is able to make the most of the opportunities offered in our country and get the support they need to make their lives a success. And that's why my combined government responsibilities make so much sense together. As Minister for Leveling Up Communities and Equalities, I can work to ensure everyone can benefit as we build back better wherever they are in the country and regardless of their sex, age or any other characteristic. 
Uh, one particularly interesting part of the APPG report on men and boys is a focus on getting a better understanding of why they face the specific barriers they do. This is a priority shared by myself and other equality ministers. Our data and evidence-driven approach to equality ensures we consider sex alongside factors like race, sexual orientation, geography, and socioeconomic background, so we can ensure we are leveling up right across the country. And this approach helps inform uh, policy making right across government. So all my ministerial colleagues contribute to tackling the specific problems faced by men and boys. Um, the member for Paisley and Renfrewshire North took an interesting approach uh, to, this, uh, to, to this debate. Um, I tend to believe that in, on these occasions we highlight the positive more than the negative. And uh, he made some statements which I thought I, I might give, a, give an alternative view on. You know, when he said, it is men who are overwhelmingly responsible for the violence perpetrated against women. It's true. But they're also overwhelmingly uh, the ones who perpetrate the violence against other men, of which the numbers are far greater. And this is why the point my right honourable friend for Basingstoke made about this is not a, a zero-sum game. What we want to tackle is violence. Whether it's violence against women and girls or violence generally, we do highlight areas where we think there are particular problems, but a holistic approach is the one that solves, um, uh, that I think is best to resolve the issue. And in terms of how we talk about identity, I think we can do so in a way that 